So first thing we're going to do is define a reaction mechanism. There's going to be a lot of correct ways to word this. Your definition should have something to do, uh, should include something about curved arrows. Reaction mechanisms always use curved arrows to show the movement of electrons. And maybe also say something about the detailed description of how the bonds are broken uh, and or formed. So something along those lines, you're looking for like kind of the keywords you're looking for. We definitely need to have curved arrows. When anybody asks you to draw a reaction mechanism, what that means, the way that you should interpret that as you need to draw curved arrows in your description it needs to involve the use of curved arrows and then also maybe something about showing the breaking and the forming of bonds so down here we're going to practice that we're going to propose a reaction mechanism that means curved arrows propose a reaction mechanism for the following generic substitution reaction using curved arrows just in case you didn't get the message definitely use curved arrows so we can see when we're looking at this reaction we can see that we are substituting the chlorine for the bromine in the product over here the chlorine has been replaced with a bromine we're going to do that by breaking the carbon chlorine bond and making a new bond between the carbon and the bromine the bromine has a negative formal charge on it and that negative formal charge means that it has an extra set of electrons and those extra set of electrons can be used to form that carbon bromine bond. So what I'm going to do is draw a curved arrow even though I'm not actually showing a lone pair. When we're not actually showing a lone pair we could also start the curved arrow from the, the negative formal charge. I'm going to show my curved arrow going onto that carbon where I want the carbon bromine bond to form and then also don't forget that we're going to break that carbon chlorine bond so to do that I'm going to take the electrons in the carbon chlorine bond curved arrow showing those electrons moving onto the chlorine atom as a lone pair to give the negative formal charge. Now we're going to propose a different mechanism for the reaction. So that means that we want to do things differently in terms of the curved arrow. So I'm going to redraw the reactants here. So this is a little bit trickier um, how we're going to actually go about doing this because we can't change the bonds that are broken. Um, that means we're, we still have to break the carbon chlorine bond and we also can't change the bond that we're forming. We still have to make the carbon bromine bond, but we can change the order in which the bonds are broken and formed. So in um, this example up here, we had everything kind of happening all at the exact same time. We bonded the bromine um, onto the carbon atom and then lost the chlorine atom all at the same time. So in this mechanism, what we're gonna do is make this happen one thing at a time. We're gonna begin by just having that carbon chlorine bond break. So the chlorine atom is gonna come out here, it's gonna have a negative formal charge, and where that carbon atom um, has lost the chlorine, that carbon atom is now electron deficient because when the chlorine leaves the molecule, it takes those bonding electrons with it. So this carbon atom now has a positive formal charge on it right there. So all that we've done here is just simply separated um, this molecule into two pieces. And I'm actually going to erase the bromine for now just to get it off, get it out of the way. So we can do that like that, kind of as its own individual step. And then what we can do is bring the bromide ion in and we can have the bromide ion attach itself to that carbocation. Now in the end, when it's all said and done, we still end up with the exact same products. But what we're showing here is that this happens in two separate steps. The chlorine leaves, forms a carbocation, and then the bromine attaches itself. In contrast, up here, this is all happening simultaneously. It's not two separate steps. So um, question number four says that the reaction should differ in terms of the number of steps that it takes to get from the reactants to the products. For problem number one, this takes place in one step. Every single arrow that we have in a reaction mechanism corresponds to a step. So this is all happening all at once, all in one step. If we were going to represent this with an energy diagram, it would probably look something like this. Just one step. And this reaction down here, this is two steps. Remember, the number of arrows in our mechanism corresponds to the number of steps. Two arrows, two steps. Here's step number one. And then here is step number two. And if we were going to represent that with an energy diagram, it would probably look something 
like that. Two steps. Also, these reactions are going to differ in terms of intermediates. So for problem or for, for yeah, for problem number 2, it says describe the reaction intermediate. Well, in this reaction right here, there is no intermediate. And we can see that, especially if we look at the energy diagram, we start as a reactant, we go up to the transition state, and then we go straight to the products. No intermediates are formed at all. In this reaction, we do have one intermediate, and that intermediate is our carbocation. And we can also see that reflected here in our energy diagram. We start with our reactants, we go through a transition state, and then we end up here at our intermediate, this carbocation. And then that carbocation goes to another transition state, and then it goes down to the products right there.